and will be available for viewing later on on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending today and Don, please feel free to unmute your mic and you can begin your presentation. Hey Robin, uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, as Robin said, my name is uh, Don Peterson and I will get into just a little bit of my background to give you some uh, understanding where I'm coming from. And I'm not getting the slides to go here. Oh, here we go. Um, I have my own company, Renewable Resource Solutions, which I'm president of, but one of the things that I've gotten into over the last 18 years is administering nonprofits, uh, specifically in the natural resource field. Um, I'm executive director of Glacierland RCD, which actually was the uh, organization that uh, administered the grant initially that got the ribbon wood going and then uh, once it was up and running uh, Sustainable Resources Institute is more of an incubator for projects such as the ribbon wood network so that was a transition that occurred uh, over time. Uh, Sustainable Resources Institute does a lot of work in natural resource field. We operate two uh, master logger certification programs, one in Michigan, one in Wisconsin. Uh, we offer a certification program for chainsaw trainers called SAW, Safety and Woods Worker Training. Uh, we have the women's trainers around uh, the country. And then as uh, Robin stated just a little earlier, we also have taken over operating the Urban Wood Network and Wisconsin Urban Wood. So that's just a, a little bit of what we're involved in. And where I'm from, Crystal Falls, Michigan, is in the Western Upper Peninsula. And people will say, well, what does he know about urban wood? And uh, e even though we're uh, 1,700 people, my uh, first project with urban wood was with the city of Crystal Falls, where we removed trees from um, the cemetery and a city park and got them utilized. So. Don, uh, yes. Don, I hate to interrupt you. Um, could you speak a little more directly into the microphone? Thank you. Uh, yes. How's that? That's better. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, so, and, and besides that, some of the other projects that uh, Robin already mentioned, I've actually been involved with Urban Wood for the last 20 years when I ran a chainsaw training organization training organization where my trainers came back to me and said you would not believe what is happening to some of these urban trees when they were doing training for municipalities and uh, tree services they said there's some beautiful saw logs going into the chipper so that started my interest and over the years I've been involved in many different levels with it but um, it, it's it's something that has evolved into today where we're working with uh, the Urban Wood Network in Wisconsin Urban Wood. So the, the model that's out there, uh, it look, looks at these four sectors and they can be combined or separated. Uh, you know, you got arborists and municipalities where the wood comes from, uh, sawmills and uh, other suppliers that, you know, manufacture that wood. And I guess that's one thing I want to make clear is that Urban Wood Network, uh, Wisconsin Urban Wood, we are looking at utilizing the whole tree. We'll talk a lot about making lumber and the products from lumber, but there's also uh, roughly 80% of the trees or the parts of the trees not be used for, for lumber. So what else do you do with them? So I, I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, manufacturer referring to the value added manufacturer that takes the, the products and makes a, a finished product out of it, whether it's a cabinet, mantle, coffee table, uh, whatever it is. 
And then we're also targeting design professionals, green building industry that, you know, what, where's the opportunity to use uh, wood in, uh, in architecture, in bigger construction projects. So it, it's not just manufacturing small items out of, uh, you know, a, a hobbyist workshop, but, you know, what, what's the opportunities to utilize urban wood to uh, sell the story as well as the wood itself. Uh, you know, here's, here's a tree that had to be cut down for whatever reason, disease, insect, uh, but it can live on in that community through a product. So this all, all evolved starting, uh, well, there, there were a lot of efforts going on even before 2009, but in 2009, a group got together. The, the tri-state actually was of uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois, where they got together. Uh, Edith Macra from Illinois and Jessica Simons from Michigan were two, two big parts of this. And uh, this is what they came up with is, you know, urban trees have their highest value while living. When removed, they also should be put to their highest value. And recovery and reuse are essential to sustainable urban forestry. And this does not just mean utilizing the tree, but by utilizing the tree, it can reduce cost of uh, removal for the municipalities and the arborists. And, and this is only possible through all the entities I just mentioned uh, in the previous slide working together. So. And, and we work with everyone who shares these values, can be homeowners, uh, advocates, agency people. So there, there's a lot of opportunity for, for working together. And then at that round table came uh, what the acronym that came out of it was OFPA, the Urban Forest Products Alliance. And you know they had shared goals and they, they met and got a lot of efforts going in the individual states. And, you know, the, the big things here that are listed, you know, have uh, market demand for products is strong, try to get that market demand and have the supply chain that is solid and reliable. You know, if you have a market, you got to make sure that you have a sustainable wood supply to, to make it happen. And also that the wood is coming from sustainably managed urban forests. That if trees are taken down, they're not taken down for their timber value. They're taken down because there's other issues like I, I just mentioned, whether it's, uh, you know, relocating, uh, you know, if they're widening a street or insect disease problems. So the trees are being taken down for another purpose than their timber value, but they're going to be utilized for their timber value. And, you know, a, a goal has always been that sharing, you know, experiences, both good and bad, and, you know, what, what did we do right, what did we do wrong, and how can we uh, move forward. Uh, um, came this effort from, and it was principally uh, Jessica and Edith that put together this grant in, in 2013 and applied to the Landscape Scale Restoration uh, Forest Service Grant Fund. And it was not funded that year, but it came close. And then uh, Jessica was actually the lead that year and she contacted me and said, we'd like to do this again, but I, I don't have the time to do it. Would you take it over? And that's when we applied for it through Glacier Land RCND, which is one of the non nonprofits that I work with. So we got the grant, and after that we we had a within the grant the full circle grant is what it was called, and out of that we uh, did a lot of efforts in the individual states of uh, the four states that we had involved were uh, Michigan. Illinois, Missouri, and Wisconsin. And uh, there were deliverables from the state level, but there also was a deliverable from the regional level to get this group going. And after a lot of discussion and a lot of work, uh, we came up with the Urban Wood Network. So this is a grant that started in 2014, but it wasn't until 2017 that we actually came up with 
here's here's where we're going with it, the Urban Wood Network. And the mission to inform, collaborate, and connect to build community, business, and consumer confidence in the urban wood industry. And believe me, this was a, uh, it, it took a while. We had some differences of opinion on where we should go with it and how we could uh, you know, move forward. And this is, uh, this is what we came up with and it was uh, agreed on by the, the four states that were working with it. So the, the Urban Wood Network organizational structure, you know, it, it's a network of anybody involved in utilizing urban wood. And it is not a nonprofit right now. Uh, one of the things that I have learned over the years is a lot of problems that nonprofits have with getting uh, going is they get bogged down in administration and you know insurance and all that other thing, all the other things that go with operating a separate organization. So the Sustainable Resources Institute is like an incubator for nonprofits. And the, the hope is that at one point in time, the Urban Wood Network will become its own 501c3. And the, the original intent was that the Urban Wood Network would be an association of associations, basically, of, uh, of state networks. Uh, the problem is we didn't have functional state networks other than Wisconsin Urban Wood. Both Illinois and Michigan had networks in the past that worked to some degree, but um, really when, when we got down to it, the only, uh, the only one out there that was functioning uh, as a state network was Wisconsin Urban Wood. So instead of an association of associations, we are there to help create associations. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about that later. But then what we came up with for, what, what should the guidance be? The grant officially ends in 2018. What should the guidance be for the Urban Wood Network? And that's where we came up with, well, let's, let's set a minimum. For any states that have five or more members, they don't need to be an official association or network, but if there's five or more members in a state, uh, and they will be put on the committee. And then for those members where there isn't five or they uh, couldn't, uh, or, or there wasn't an interest in electing somebody from that individual state, then we split the country up into two regions and that's east and west of the Mississippi. And I will get into the, that in a little bit. Uh, the membership dues and structure, $50, $50 annually, due by uh, February 15th. And basically the eligibility is agreement with the key tenants of the Urban Wood Network, which is basically what I just showed you in the previous slides, what came out of um, the agreement through UFPA and that whole, um, the, the whole networking that occurred before that. Then assign membership agreement and payment of the annual dues. So the, the key tenants, um, you know, I, I won't read them off, but basically highest value while they're living, uh, sustainable recovery and highest best use, um, you know, and, and the highest best use in some cases might be firewood. If, if it's going to cost more uh, to get a log, uh, an individual log sawn up, as most of you know, there's a lot of landowners that think, or homeowners that think the tree in their yard is worth thousands of dollars. And, you know, to cut it, to get it removed and get it out and get it to a place where you can saw it up actually will end up costing money instead of yielding money. But there is the possibility of reducing costs by not having to deal with that piece of the tree in, in other ways, such as chipping. And you know, a, a key thing is to increase uh, end user demand for urban forest products. And, and one of the things we keep hearing over and over again is it, it's not just the wood that comes out of there, but it's the story behind the wood. What's, what's the story with that tree? And that's where a lot of the 
people involved in the urban wood industry right now have a system or are developing a system for tracking that tree and tracking the wood that comes from that tree. So you, you have the story that this tree had to be removed from this street corner or from this yard. And so you have that history, you're selling the story along with the wood. And that we're committed to working in partnership with a number of different stakeholders. As I mentioned earlier, this is people in urban forestry, but also agency people and just advocates that are out there. And as I mentioned previously, the steering committee was an election we held. Uh, the steering committee actually just came into existence in July of this year, 2019. And we have uh, a West and a East uh, regional representative, Jennifer Elger from Urban Salvage and Reclaim Woods, which is a very active group uh, west of the Rockies, uh, but they have members from across the country as well. And Joe Lennon from uh, Virginia is actually an agency person, forest utilization and marketing specialist uh, for Urban Wood with the uh, state of Virginia. And Dwayne Sperber uh, from Wisconsin, where we, we have 38 members from Wisconsin Urban Wood. So Wisconsin had their, their own election for a representative. And Dwayne is founder and owner of Woodward uh, Urban Forest Products. And our goal at the Urban Wood Network is to provide needed technical assistance to these groups down here. And it's not saying that we have, that I have that technical assistance, but if somebody has a issue or uh, a, a situation that they're, they're looking for advice on, we can help connect them. And it very well could be connecting them to other UWN members it could be an agency specialist it could be a forest products uh, specialist with either the uh, an individual state or the federal government so that is a, a a big thing that we look to do and like i said a lot of this is just connecting you know when somebody tells me what their their issue is um I say, wow, I, I know somebody in a different state who has, has already encountered that, and I will see if uh, they're willing to talk to you. And in almost all cases, uh, it, it's a very great group that they're, they're interested in building uh, the concept of utilizing urban wood as a whole, uh, not just in their individual business. So we're looking at the, the greater visibility, you know, the more we keep talking about it, um, you know, the the brand of Urban Wood, uh, we're, we're having a lot of discussions with that within the steering committee on how do we do that. There's been talk of certification, um, branding as a certification, uh, whatever it ends up being, it has to be a common thing. So when we talk about Urban Wood, people know what we're talking about. Uh, we're also uh, looking to develop marketing materials in addition to the website that we have, um, you know, and just continue to create product recognition that these products came from Urban Wood. And just the, the networking opportunities to keep talking about how we can work within states, uh, between states, you know, what, what kind of impact can we have? And, you know, to kind of be a clearinghouse as well for any updates that are out there or incentives that there might be uh, just opportunities that, that we can all take advantage of. Our current membership, uh, we, we did have uh, last year, 2018 was our first full year and we, uh, because we still had the grant in effect, we offered free membership and I believe our, we topped out at 144 uh, people for 2018. Uh, when we went to um, having to put the $50 fee on it, um, 
you know, we're, we're at 74 members right now, uh, hoping to continue to grow this. Uh, we, we get interest, we get inquiries uh, almost every day. Wisconsin is, uh, Wisconsin Urban Wood as a network uh, pays for their members to be members of the Urban Wood Network through the association. So when they pay their membership fee uh, to Wisconsin, that automatically gets in, them into the Urban Wood Network. And, and that was a big discussion we had early on is we do not want the Urban Wood Network to be a choice between belonging to a state or local network and Urban Wood Network. We, we want to, have, our, our goal is, as I stated earlier, is to be an association of associations. But until we get to that point, um, we, we will take the individual members and work with them and wherever uh, we get enough people involved, uh, help them to create that state or local network. So right, right now we got representatives from uh, 19 different states and, uh, two countries besides the U.S. with uh, Canada and Switzerland. So we, we have interest. Uh, we've had some great interest in our webinars and we will uh, continue to, to promote that. And as I said, this, this is our goal it is uh, we will accept individual memberships where there isn't a local group and working with like-minded members uh, within a state to get them to uh, to organize and and maybe that that won't happen maybe there isn't that level of interest there and then we will stick with individual members but uh, we definitely want to promote and extend benefits of state level associations becoming a member of uh, UWN uh, this is you know here's what membership means you know, the tenants that uh, I had already covered and, you know, why, why belong? Um, greater visibility and access to new customer groups and creations, as I said, as we keep promoting the, the brand um, and the markets, developing markets, uh, you know, let, let's, let's work together and create this together rather than have all the Did for I'd say probably 20, 20 years plus for some of these groups. So that this is this is an effort to create that network of common, you know, commonality. And and part of the problem that I've I've seen uh, with this is that we've got all different levels uh, of uh, commitment, I guess would be a best, best way to say it is we have hobbyists out there that are creating product. There's a lot of hobbyists, a lot of woodworkers that do it on the side, retired people that, that, uh, do it as a hobby, uh, versus, uh, those that are out there creating a full-time business out of it. And I think there's plenty of room for both, but, you know, be cognizant that being cognizant of there's those different levels is something that I think is very important. So for municipalities, you know, one, one of the biggest things I see is, you know, the, the possibility of cost reduction. If they don't have to deal with those parts of the, the tree that can be, you know, shipped out in round form in whatever lengths. You know, I've seen them shipped out in anywhere from six foot to 22 foot lengths. Then uh, they can just go off the job. They don't have to mess with them after that, whether it goes out in their own trucks or there's another uh, operator that comes in and picks them up, it can be, can be cost reduction. And how, how to identify uh, potential markets for the wood that's coming off of these uh, municipal properties. You know, just getting that connection is, you know, the especially if you're talking about municipalities and talking tra to traditional forest industry, there, there's a huge disconnect there. Now with the development of a separate urban forestry industry, I think there's there's more connection. 
you know, and, and just talking about potential working relationships. Is there a sawmill that will come in, a portable mill that could cut up uh, some of the, the wood for uh, benches or uh, bookshelves or whatever for that municipality? And, and what a great story for that municipality to share that they, they have wood products in their offices and their shops that uh, were created from wood that came off of, uh, that came from trees from their properties. Um, you know, and, and that's part of, you know, utilizing the wood resources internally. We've had uh, one community in Wisconsin where they're creating boardwalks, where they brought a sawmill in, they sawed up the boards, uh, and they created a boardwalk and they've actually had a sale for the lumber as well. So, so there's a number of different models out there that can work. Uh, we have communities that will do an auction or they will sell directly to a logger or a sawmill if they have enough, uh, if they have enough volume. And that is a big thing that we've always run into. Is there enough volume? Uh, when do municipalities do their uh, removals? And, you know, is, is there gonna be enough volume to go to an individual market? Um, and, and just speaking to urban wood and community sustainability is uh, utilizing urban wood is recycling. It's instead of chipping it up and putting it in a landfill, it is recycling. It is the environmentally uh, responsible thing to do. So uh, getting that message across to uh, municipalities is, is one of our primary goals. I mean, they've got a lot of other things on their plate and to look at this one little piece sometimes takes a lot of effort, but once they see it, we've, had several communities uh, anywhere from the city of Milwaukee to uh, small communities like I was mentioning Crystal Falls where they will look at uh, you know how can they utilize those trees when they have to be removed you know an arborist again same, same thing as with the municipalities with cost reduction if they don't have to uh, contend with that large part of the tree and they can just get it out of there in a length that will go to a, a market that can be a benefit to them. In some cases, depending on the species, they might actually get some funding from it. We have had several arborists that have branched out into either they have purchased their own portable mill or they pile up the logs until they have enough and then they bring in a uh, a, a contract, a portable mill to saw the lumber up for them, and then they they have we we have one guy that has uh, has his own storefront where he now sells the the lumber and the and some finished products. So there, there's a lot of opportunities out there, and utilizing urban wood to differentiate your business basically is a selling point to the land to the homeowner is, you know, we have to take this tree out, here's what we're gonna do with it. They, they can sell that story to the homeowner that we're not just gonna bring it to the landfill, but this will create a product and potentially maybe that homeowner wants a product from that. So just some of the efforts uh, that we have done with the Urban Wood Network, uh, obviously one of the first things we did was uh, create a website, which I would encourage you to go to our, uh, our website, the urbanwoodnetwork.org. Uh, we've got the past webinars archived on there, but we also have a lot of other, other information. So what we have done to date is, here's the, the four, Four webinars that we started with, urban tree removals, reducing costs and promoting utilization. Uh, one, one of the things we did with all of these was have uh, different speakers that gave uh, different perspectives on uh, how they looked at these topics. Uh, urban lumber, same thing, we had different, different people talking about it. And then producing urban wood products, looking at you know, from everything from selling the lumber to creating those value added uh, urban wood commodities. 
and then starting a state urban wood network. Uh, that was principally speaking from Wisconsin Urban Wood, what was done to get that organization up and running. We have some great advocates in the state that uh, came together and worked together and have done, done a great job with that. And then the Urban Wood Toolkit Series. This was uh, funding from uh, the forest products section of the Michigan DNR uh, went to uh, Jessica Simon to put this together. And she, uh, she put these together and um, I am missing the name of uh, the person that she was working with right now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not coming. Margaret, Margaret Miller. Thank you, Carrie just uh, chimed in for me. Margaret Miller uh, worked with uh, Jessica to put these together. Jessica went on to another job getting out of the urban woodwork, which was a great loss to, to the movement because Jessica was just a great advocate and a great spokesperson for Wisconsin Urban Wood. Uh, Margaret put on these two webinars with uh, some, some assistance as well, other speakers involved. And um, so this is a toolkit that's out there that was produced with funding from uh, the Michigan DNR. And upcoming webinars, uh, when we created the steering committee, we, uh, we, we talked about what, what are the needs out there? What should we be looking at into the future? And that's why we're, we're always looking for input. What, what are the type of things that you are looking for out there that will help you to get more involved with, uh, with utilizing urban wood? So what we've come up with, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, one of the webinars we already did was, uh, developing a state network and that was Wisconsin Urban Wood, which was already in place. Uh, what we have now is uh, we've got a group out in Nebraska uh, in the city of Lincoln and the surrounding area that's really been uh, a go-getter in getting a network established. They have uh, shown a lot of interest in the Urban Wood Network, uh, asked us to come out to speak there in November of last year. And we worked with uh, the Nebraska Forest Service, Adam Smith and Heather Nobert are uh, two, two people that are very involved out there in uh, helping this move forward. Uh, we actually went out there in uh, April and did a study where the Nebraska Forest Service has a portable mill and we set up 28 logs that came uh, from the city of Lincoln and did an analysis of those logs for the Nebraska Forest Service. So that was a, that was a very interesting study where we looked at you know, sign up both traditional four quarter lumber, but also doing the live edge slabs and looking at production rates and 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 what could you expect for for a return when you do this for a small mill operator. And, and I will tell you one of the biggest things that we've identified, you know, getting off topic just a little bit here is that uh, a lot of people are into a portable mill and doing sawing and producing the lumber, but the next step is the problem, uh, drying the lumber. Is, you know, do they know how to sticker it properly if you're gonna air dry it? Because if it isn't stickered properly, you could you could lose a lot of lumber value. And if if you're looking at a faster turnaround, what what are the drying capabilities? Are there kilns out there where you can bring the wood to? So uh, we have found that there's a lot of people interested in getting the logs cut up in the lumber, but then where's the next step? Where Where's the drying capability? And there are a number of people that have built their own kilns, small, small capacity kilns, but you know, for their, for their work, if they're looking to create the end products themselves, uh, you know, sawing it up, drying it, and then creating those products is a uh, is a pretty uh, pretty likely scenario. And I, I bring that up just because that's been a lot of the discussion out in Nebraska. 
uh, and they are in the formative stages. They do not have the network uh, developed yet. So we thought this would be a real interesting webinar for them to talk about during the process of it. They're looking for different funding sources to help them get up and running. They're looking at uh, all the different partners and we're looking for them to talk about their challenges that they've run into, how they've overcome them and, and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this is gonna be of interest to a lot of people because they're a, a very dynamic group out in Nebraska. And then another one that was thrown out from one of our uh, committee members is just the future visioning. What what are the trends? What you know? One of the things that uh, this is Joe Lennon who brought this up is, um, you know, live edge slabs are very popular. Is that something that's going to continue on, or are there there are niche markets that? You know, it, it's not high production, but there's always going to be a sale for products in this certain niche market. And then it, it just makes sense for diversification to, you know, be, be able to produce different products. You know, if you're a value added manufacturer, what are the trends out there? What, what can you do? Urban lumber standards is something that uh, it has been a uh, a big topic, uh, Jennifer Elder's group out in California has been working on these for quite a while. Uh, we've had discussions within Wisconsin Urban Wood about it, and this is something that's that's going to come to fruition here in the, the next few months is, you know, if, if somebody, and, and it doesn't have to apply, it is something that a lot of the architects, uh, contractors look for, uh, they're, they're looking for, you know, they're used to uh, traditional forest industry and the grades they have that that, that isn't always applicable to uh, urban wood. So what, what can be done to standardize that to, you know, we're, we're looking for something that uh, is is fairly general, but it will still give some assurance to those people that are looking for for that wood. And then also the drying standards. What what does it mean to be dry? And you know, there's some confusion sometimes of heat treating, and and just to explain that so people know what they're getting or what they need to produce. And then, as I mentioned earlier, certification is something we've discussed. Uh, quite frequently. So, you know, what, what does that look like? Uh, is, is there a separate separate urban wood certification out there or is branding sufficient? And then the urban, urban lumber business. Uh, what, what do urban wood business owners need to know? If you're gonna market urban lumber, what, what is it that customers are looking for? You know, as I just stated, uh, the grading is something that uh, has come up quite frequently, uh, drying to what moisture level is it dried. And then also, if you're in the business, how, how do you use that? You're, as I mentioned earlier, how do you use that story? Uh, where did that tree come from? Do you have the tracking? As I mentioned, there's a number of companies out there right now that have uh, either used a commercial uh, tracking system or have developed their own. So where that tree was cut, when it was cut, how it was manufactured, and here's, here's how it got to the product it is today. And then uh, the last one we had talked about, which I mentioned early on, was utilization of the whole tree. You know, what, what can be utilized from urban wood besides saw logs. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of trees that, you know, just because of the nature of urban trees that they branch out so quickly that there might not be a log in there even, or even if you get one log out, there's the rest of the tree, what do you do with it? And in those areas where we're fortunate enough to have pulp mills uh, like Wisconsin, uh, we, we have a couple communities that are working with uh, pulp mills to e either go through a logger to sell it to the pulp mill or they sell directly to the pulp mill. Firewood is always a big thing. Um, that is something else we're involved with is Firewood Scout where, you know, promote 
uh, buy local, burn local. Uh, you know, when we did the large removal project in Kenosha County that Rob been, uh, mentioned, uh, over a thousand cords from that removal went to either firewood or pulpwood, the majority going to commercial firewood producers down in that area. Um, always the possibility of fuel chips or uh, boilers that use wood fuel. Uh, mulch is a pretty common use. Um, some states have uh, specs for, for chips for using on playground that if it's done correctly, uh, the right size, the right species, uh, there is a higher value there. And then carbon, whether it's uh, biochar or another carbon product that is an industry that is uh, constantly evolving. And then composting, uh, there's been many cases where wood chips have either been used in with municipal sludge or with agricultural waste to uh, speed up composting. And usually that's not a high economic return, it's more just getting rid of the chips, but just some, some potential uses. And here's, here's another webinar that's coming up that Wisconsin Urban Wood is working on, uh, that they had some funding uh, from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources to help out with this. Uh, so this is just uh, you know, an example of what one of our, our network members is, is doing. And um, architects and designers, uh, Dwayne Sperber, who was mentioned earlier as being on our steering committee, has had a lot of interest in this and uh, success in working with different uh, communities. We have a library in the city of Madison that has spec urban wood in their reconstruction project. Uh, the Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee, uh, which is the Milwaukee Bucks Arena, has urban wood into it. Uh, so there's there's examples out there. It continues to be pushed. Uh, getting the continuing education credits for the architects is uh, a big thing that we found out is a, a huge uh, attraction for the architects and something that we're continuing to uh, investigate as to, to how we can get them more involved. And upcoming work that we've identified uh, through the steering committee is, as I mentioned earlier, adopting the grading and drying standards and always hoping to provide technical assistance to states where we've got several members that are interested. Uh, we've had a couple of states where we've gotten the membership from these individuals in the Urban Wood Network and they had no idea there was anybody else in their state that was already uh, doing similar work and we've connected those individuals. So even though there might not be a network in some of those states, we still have been successful in bringing uh, individuals together to you know, talk about common problems or, or potentially work together and maybe uh, help each other out. And then uh, obviously we're always looking to update and keep our website current. And one of the things we're, we're looking at in the future is seeking sponsorship. We're still trying to figure out exactly what that's looking like. And uh, we are always looking to recruit more members and looking for suggestions and uh, opportunities for, for expansion of our, our network. And uh, with that, I am um, was hoping that we would get uh, get some questions. Dan, um, the webinars that you were just speaking of for the Urban Wood Network are they available now to look at on the website? They are the ones that we had. Let me just back up here. So yes, right here, uh, these four. And then, whoop, sorry, I went too fast. And these two are currently archived and are available on the website. Okay, so that was the one, um, <clears throat> one thing that was asked. And um, I am planning on also posting these uh, webinars on the emerald-board.info website as well. So you'll have a couple places. Oh, we're getting questions. 
Um, what is happening in Indiana with urban wood? Uh, honestly, I think we've had, I got to look at my sheet. I think we only have one member there. We have had conversations. Um, we No, I'm looking, we have two members in Indiana right now. And honestly, I have not had any direct contact uh, with either of those. I know we, and I'm trying to remember, we've got, um, I believe we had somebody, uh, this was who Jessica worked with, was the city forester in Grand Rapids has went to a city in Indiana. And we were hoping to get some momentum there. And I am uh, missing his name right now, but that is, uh, that is the extent of what we have in Indiana. Sorry, I couldn't be, couldn't be more helpful there. Uh, let's see, the, another question here is, how do you handle removing trees infested with pests and pathogens like invasive species? Do you use the wood without spreading? How do you use the wood without spreading these pests further? That, that is a, a great question and, you know, we, we, promote adhering to what's what's there both at the federal level and the state level. Uh, there is usually restrictions from APHIS and from the, the state agencies on how to do that. That is information um, that I know in Wisconsin Urban Wood we have available. It's kind of hard to do that through the Urban Wood Network because that can differ state to state, but that's why we promote working very closely with the state agencies um, in Wisconsin. It's both the Department of Agriculture and Department of Natural Resources. Uh, but that is that is something, and as I mentioned with Firewood Scout, that is something we also promote is, you know, buy local and, and use local. So that, I guess that's my best answer is we, we promote what the, the states and the federal government have come up with. Okay, um, I am, uh, Carrie has answered the question, um, a little bit of some, given some information here, if you wanna connect with the Indiana members, um, I just put it in the chat pod and it's also in the question and answer pod. Um, if you want, need some, um, the resource connections there. Uh, what about worker safety during harvest of trees? Do you have any guidelines is another question we have here. And, and again, uh, those are guidelines that are already out there through ANSI standards and OSHA. And as I mentioned, we do have a organization, you know, it's not directly affiliated with Urban Wood Network, but uh, SAW, Safety and Woods Worker Training, where we certify the chainsaw trainers to go out there and what they have four different levels of training that they do. You know, there's the initial level and then all the way up to the much more complicated. And so it, it's something we promote through a sister organization and Carrie has put that up on the screen. And we have trainers in Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Washington and but they do travel all over the country and there are other trainers out there as well uh, but our group is we do have annual training in order to get in they have to be certified uh, or, or they have to go through a process where our certifying board that we have for SA uh, approves of them and then they will go out and do that individual training uh, not only for municipalities and arborists, but also for homeowners, landowners, and loggers. Okay, I am putting down here also in the chat pod, Carrie's info, so there's a couple places people can see it. The, the SAW Training Certification Program website um, link. So if folks wanna get on that, that's available if you wanna look in the chat pod. So, um, I have, you know, we've, we've been talking about um, what can happen, what, um, what people could, you know, possibly how they could network with the urban wood network and how that's, you know, the important things they could be doing. 
um, it, that would be helpful. Um, I'm wondering of, of the folks that are still, of the participants that are still on, are there any of you that are, you know, are you, are you already connected with Urbanwood experts in your community? Or, you know, if you want to chat on the chat pod and say, yes, no, yes, this is what I do, that would be great. A little more information from you. Um, and if there's any more questions for Don, we are, you know, hoping that you folks will put those on here. Or when I send you your email tomorrow, you will be um, able to ask Don some questions as well. Well, I'm going to send you his contact info and um, can, you can go from there as well. But uh, yeah, this, it sounds like there's plenty of opportunities here. It sounds like that, you know, that, you know, you've got some interest here on this website or, or on the, on this webinar and from your website information too, it looks, sounds like there's things that people are looking for. So I hope that this uh, webinar is kind of, you know, getting some, getting some people thinking here. I do have a question, Robin, is I have a question for the participants is what can Urban Wood Network do for you? I mean, what what isn't out there right now that you would like to see? What assistance or what what help can can we be to you? So let us know. And whether it's now or as Robin said, uh, the contact information is up there. Feel free to to contact us. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Carrie Devine. You heard me say her name a couple of times. Uh, as Robin knows, she's the one who makes things work here. If uh, you're contacting Urban Wood Network, uh, Carrie is the, the one that uh, does the day-to-day -day stuff with uh, Urban Wood Network and is uh, very proficient and knowledgeable about it. So uh, when you call here, you'd either get uh, Carrie or myself. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions or I'm going to wait a couple minutes to see if some folks want to type something in or are typing in, sometimes it takes a little while before this pops up. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, are there, um, as far as what you, the goals and that kind of thing, are, do you have any specific goals you're kind of heading toward? Um, for the next year um, that are, you know, kind of top priorities? Well, probably the top one would be the standards is, is looking at uh, the grading and the drying uh, standards to get that done. As I said, Jennifer Elger out in California has been working a lot. She's involved people from across the country and in getting input on it. And what she what she puts together, we are uh, intending on uh, adopting because the other two committee members, Joe and Duane, are also on her committee. So, and, and we're getting input from, you know, uh, other members as well. And and the webinars, uh, we've had some great successes with the webinars and got a lot of participants and. Uh, feedback from those so that's definitely a priority for us to keep identifying topics that people are interested in uh, to to do those webinars on and you know we're always looking for suggestions on potential speakers and uh, you know and, and I think the big thing is just increasing the membership when we first started Urban Wood Network we were looking at a Lake States Midwest regional um, membership where, you know, the four states we started with, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri, and then, you know, broadening out around around them. But, you know, as soon as we went live with our uh, website and recruiting members, uh, I, I think our first members came from Florida, and mm -hmm. we got members from all over the country. So uh, we, even though we intended to be regional, we kind of evolved into national right away and that's why we're you know whether, whether we're going to be national or not you know that's why we're working with these other groups why we have those representatives on our committee to to see what what the best solution is sounds good okay um we have a question are you more focused on recovering wood on public property or is it financially viable to also work with private indiv individuals 
And would it help your group if we pointed private homeowners your way? Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned in the, in the presentation was volume is a big deal. And for municipalities where they're going to do a, a huge removal, like I mentioned, the 4,200 trees in Kenosha, there's where you're going to develop some markets where you can uh, go into the traditional industry or if you have a big enough market in the existing urban industry, you can do it. But yes, there are arborists, as I mentioned, we have arborists that have uh, created their, their own inventory of logs. Some have purchased their own sawmills. Uh, a lot of arborists, even if they don't have that interest to go to the next level, they have been connected to people with uh, sawmills. So when they get a tree that they know enough to recognize it. Um, I, I hesitate a little bit when uh, say to connect us with um, private homeowners, because we do get a lot of calls. A lot of them are expecting a huge return from their tree. And at best, most of the time it's reduced cost. So we, we do direct them as Carrie has up on, on the screen here, we do direct them to the local experts in their area. So I, I definitely want to encourage but not to have great expectations that they're going to get a lot of money for their tree. Okay. I, I think that does kind of answer also another question here that says, does this network help connect us with buyers of wood products? So. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Okay. That is one of our primary purposes. All righty. Um, that's all I have right now. I think we're getting close to noon and um, at, at least here in Michigan and uh, our, our hour is almost up. So I think what I'll do is from here on out, we'll direct questions to you, Don, e via email, um, that kind of thing. And um, we'll end the meeting, but this has been a great information, um, you know, great informational webinar for me. I've learned a lot um, and I hope it has been for everyone else. I hope everyone has a good day, and thanks again, Don and Carrie. You've all both been great in uh, presenting this information for us, and we, are, we appreciate you taking the time to do that. Robin, thank you for the opportunity. This, this is uh, a great opportunity for us to promote Urban Wood Network, and thank you for thinking of us. You bet. My pleasure. Have a good day, everybody.